behind everything you do is a promise. Better. Better because we care, because we all have a common goal, to be better at cooking, to be better at eating right, and taking care of ourselves, to live in a better community, to just feel better. Today, and tomorrow, and the next day. Do it for you. Do it for them. Do it to prove something to yourself. Do it to carry on a family recipe. Or just because. But when you aim for the stars, better just works. We're fosters. And we're better. Because of you. Because of them. Because of this place. And because we care. You hear people talk about the economy all the time. But what is the economy exactly? The economy is the flow of money between the people, the companies, and the government in the Cayman Islands. Why is it important to understand the economy? Well, just like the engine of a car, the better we understand the economy, the better we can make it run, and the more prosperous we can become as a community. The first important thing to understand about the economy is that the private sector is the main source of all wealth. Think about it. Most people work for companies in the private sector, both big companies and small businesses. But even if you work for the government, your salary comes from the fees and duties paid to the government by private sector companies and their employees. That's why we call the private sector the prosperity engine that powers our economy and drives the country forward. When business is booming, companies have more money to spend on salaries, bonuses, and promotions. Employees with more money buy more products and services from other businesses. All those people and businesses spending money generates revenue for the government, which pays for important services like education, roads, emergency services, and care for the elderly. So when the private sector is doing well, everyone does well. But when the private sector isn't doing well, like during a recession, the money dries up and everyone suffers. So when you hear people ask, how do we make our country more prosperous? The answer is pretty simple. Grow the economy. After all, you can't get more money from a system that isn't making more money. That's not economics. That's just common sense. In this video series, we're going to take a closer look at our economy to see how we can fuel our prosperity engine and how to make sure everyone benefits. For now, thanks for watching. And remember to share this video with your family and friends so they can learn more about our economic prosperity engine. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for the third of 19 candidate forums for the 2021 general elections in the Cayman Islands, being hosted by the Cayman Islands Chamber of Commerce in association with Fosters. My name is Mike Gibbs, and I have the honor of being the current president of the Chamber of Commerce. I will also be one of the panelists asking the questions this evening, along with Mr. Colin Robinson, treasurer of the chamber, and also chairman of the Insurance Managers Association of Cayman. I'd like to begin my opening comments by welcoming each of our prospect candidates, Austin Harris, Michael Miles, and Sabrina Turner, and thanking them for accepting the Chamber's invitation to participate in this forum. Your willingness to appear on the same platform demonstrates to voters that uh, you, you take the democratic process seriously and are ready to respond to a series of questions on the top issues as identified by a recent online Chamber survey. More than 400 responses and more than 200 questions have been submitted via the survey and these will help to frame the questions for this evening's forum. There is certainly not enough time to ask all the questions, but we will do our best to cover the topics that have been identified as the most important in, to the Cayman Islands and the prospect constituency. When the Chamber was established in 1965, the goal was to create an organisation that supports, promotes 
and protects the interests and welfare of its members and the wider community. Being nonpartisan, we have hosted forums every election year since the 1988 election. So for nine elections, we have provided members of the community with an opportunity to hear from their candidates and educate themselves before election day. These forums have taken weeks of planning and preparation with all the credit going to the hardworking chamber staff and would not have been possible without the financial support of our sponsors, Fosters, Affinity, Bodens Legal and Corporate and Dart. So a big thank you to them. I would also like to extend a wholehearted thanks to our media partners, Cayman Mile Road, Cayman Life TV, Radio Cayman, Government Information Services, and ICCI FM for agreeing to broadcast tonight's forum. It is the first time we have live streamed the forums on the internet, and we hope that this new format will enable even more people to watch them in the comfort of their home. It is now time to begin this evening's forum, and I will therefore turn the proceedings over to Mr. Will Pinot, CEO of the Chamber, who will serve as this evening's moderator, and he will explain the rules of the forum and introduce the prospect candidates. Good evening, candidates. Good evening. Good evening. Well, thank you for joining us. The rules for tonight's forum are as follows. Each candidate will be asked a series of questions. You'll have two minutes to answer if you choose to do so. Each candidate will be allowed to answer the question without interruption and is free to differ with an opinion or position of another candidate during your allotted time. Candidates should deal solely with the issues. And at the conclusion of the forum, each candidate will be allowed two and a half minutes to deliver a closing statement. I will now introduce the candidates for the prospect constituency. We begin with Sabrina Turner. Sabrina Turner grew up in central Georgetown on Elgin Avenue. She has been CEO of Cayman Immigration Consultant Services Limited since 2006. She has been a notary public for 16 years, prospect community resident for 17 years, and leader of the prospect community group for five years from 2015 to 2020. Sabrina has worked in the medical field from 1990 to 1994, was an employee of the Cayman Islands Department of Immigration from 1994 in the capacities of immigration officer, was an enforcement officer, and assistant secretary of the Caymanian Status and Permanent Residency Board. She was also the host of the talk show Topical on Vibe 98.9 FM in 2009 and host on Radio Cayman 89.9 FM Business Buzz from 2011. Mrs. Turner is married and, and a mother of two sons, and she enjoys community service, cooking, and making a difference in all she has set out to do. Welcome. Thank you. Our next candidate is Michael Miles. Michael was born and raised in central Georgetown. His love for the country started when he played youth football under influential mentors and represented the Cayman Islands at the national and international level for 20 years, playing goalie on the national football team. It was through football that he was able to gain a scholarship. Michael graduated from Lindsey Wilson College in Columbia, Kentucky, USA, with a bachelor's degree in social work, returning to the island later on. For nearly 30 years, Michael has worked in roles focused on social development, addressing issues related to family, youth, health, and community. As he began his career at the Department of Social Services as a social worker intern in 1992, and then a social worker in 1995. He transitioned to the post of team leader at the Cayman Islands Marine Institute in 1997, where he supported the role of 16 youth boys back to mainstream public schools. Michael left government in 2017, and for two years played an integral role at the Hope Academy as the Dean of Students, ensuring students are thriving. He established his own business, Inspire Cayman Training Limited, to improve the standards of technical, vocational, and education training and vocational skills gap in the Cayman Islands. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Austin Harris was born at the Georgetown Hospital and is the proud family to a 15-year-old father to a 15-year-old son. He attended Triple C School from K to 12, graduating with academic scholars in business studies. He later earned a Bachelor's of Science degree in finance 
and began his professional career in the financial services industry, first in retail banking and afterward in private wealth management before changing careers entirely to a more community-focused profession, namely talk radio. For nearly eight years, Austin Harris was host of the number one rated morning talk show, Came in Crosstalk. It was from the experience gained in this vocation that led Austin Harris to be, first be elected to Parliament in 2017 for the constituency of Prospect. He would later join the coalition government of the National Unity as first counselor, now parliamentary secretary for employment, border control, community affairs, international trade, investment, aviation, and maritime affairs. He is seeking re-election for the constituency of Prospect as an independent member of the progressive-led alliance team. Welcome, candidates. We're going to take a short commercial break, um, and right when we return, we'll begin our questioning. Please stay tuned. Behind everything we do is a promise. Better. Better because we care. Because we all have a common goal. To be better at cooking. To be better at eating right. And taking care of ourselves. To live in a better community. To just feel better. Today and tomorrow and the next day. Do it for you. Do it for them. Do it to prove something to yourself. Do it to carry on a family recipe. Or just because. But when you aim for the stars, better just works. We're fosters. And we're better. Because of you. Because of them. Because of this place. And because we care. Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum for Prospect. Chamber panelists President Mike Gibbs and Treasurer Colin Robinson will present tonight's series of questions to the candidates, beginning with Sabrina Turner. Mike? Thank you, Will, and once again, good evening, candidates. Um, first question, as Will outlined, will go to Ms. Turner. Uh, first question really is, uh, why have you decided to run for elected office, and what makes you the candidate of choice for the voters of Prospect? Thank you for that question. Good evening. The reason I am running um, is because of, I want to continue to serve the people of the Prospect Electoral District at an even higher level. After being able to serve them in a leadership role as their community leader uh, for almost six years, the gratitude uh, that, have, that, I, that I have felt from the people, residents and kids alike, um, has resonated with me. And that is why I want to give of myself the overwhelming support and resounding sound for more female representation in our parliament has also been uh, my true push and reason for wanting to give more of, of myself. Now, being able to represent the people of Prospect and the Cayman Islands as a whole on a local, national and international level I feel that I will bring great wealth of knowledge and bring the female perspective uh, on even, even footing with my male counterparts if the people of Prospect gives me that opportunity. Now, when we look at me being a past civil servant, a mother, um, a wife, and we look at the fast pace in which um, our, our country, it almost appears as though we're spiraling out of control. Uh, the total disregard from what I'm seeing um, is leaving our people behind, the disregard for our environment. And I'm willing and able to take that risk to put myself forward for the movement um, for equality and a fair, balanced style of governance in order to make us move forward. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Miles, over to you for the same question. I'm about outcomes. Thank you for the question. Um, Mike, um, I'm all about outcomes. My job for the last 30 years is to get stuff done, not to talk about it. Um, I believe that our country is at a crossroad. And for the last 30 years, multiple governments have been informed. They have been unsuccessful in doing it. I brought this binder here today because it's one of the things that I carry on my shoulder. 
I want to make sure that our country and our people in particular stays ahead of the game. We're losing. We're losing out there. I've been involved in youth development for almost 30 years. We haven't made strides. What we've done is just kick the football down the road. And I think it's time that we now move things forward, which means that things like education have to be dealt with. Our environment, Medicaid, uh, our, our healthcare system, in particular mental health, which is near and dear to my heart. I also believe that equality is really touched on, you know, her being a woman. There are so many things about the female counterpart that puts them at a disadvantage. I have four daughters. I want to make sure that I represent them well. But Parliament have become a place of career politicians, a lot of talk and a lot of rhetoric, a lot of backbiting, a lot of fighting. My job isn't to do that or get into that. Look at my record. I'm about outcomes. We have to start to look at how we proceed forward in our country because every day that I turn on the TV, we are having our children, we're having our people go into our prison system, court system. We are having our people become unemployed. Look around. We have a concrete jungle. We're losing the fact that Cayman is this beautiful place that we should enjoy. Instead, we have major developers coming in and putting in a lot of concrete, and we need to now slow that down or stop it all together. But I want to fit into a government that is about outcomes, not about outputs. Government could be a phenomenal place for us to actually move things forward for our people, and we need to start, and that's why I'm in this race. Thank you. Mr. Harris. <clears throat> First of all, I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce for hosting these debates. I think it is truly um, a value to the voting public. Uh, I also want to say a special good evening to the members of the Prospect constituency who are tuned in tonight. You certainly have uh, a difficult decision to make, but certainly I do hope that decision will be to re-elect me as your representative for Prospect. I'm standing for re-election in the constituency of Prospect on a four-year track record of proven performance. I have delivered for the people of Prospect. I have been approachable uh, for the people of Prospect, easy to talk to. Uh, and I believe my proven four-year track record of delivering on my promises um, is a significant reason for re-election. Shortly after being elected into office as an independent lone wolf, um, the independent lone wolf is attractive at the uh, campaigning level, certainly beholden to none, only the people of the Cayman Islands. But I quickly discovered that it takes a team to govern a country and to certainly deliver on promises. That was reflected in my decision early on to join and become a member of the Coalition Government of National Unity, because I believe that being a member of the government, I could be more effective in delivering on my promises to the people of Prospect. Likewise, it also meant working with established community groups that were already in place. One of those certainly was the Red Bay Prospect Community Group, uh, chaired by my opponent on the far right, Ms. Sabrina. I certainly can attest uh, to her ability and willingness to work in the community. But that group uh, largely caters to a small portion of Prospect, known as a traditional Prospect, uh, from Victory Avenue to Mangrove Avenue. There's a wider Prospect uh, that I have been able to service, whether it be uh, stationing police on Point Dexter to uh, control traffic, whether it be lighting the prospect bypass where darkness once existed, whether it be removing dangerous hedging uh, for motorists to enter the roadway on Adventure Street in Norfolk. I believe I have a Thank proven you. track record, and for that reason, I am running for re-election in prospect. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miles. This question will be for you to start with. If elected, what two or three projects or programs would you like to accomplish for the people of Prospect? Within the first 100 days, we have to do a district council. I believe that in order to engage people, we have to meet the people where they are. And currently, there's no district council. That means that the incumbent and anyone else, there's no accountability. I hear what Mr. Austin is saying about proven results. Prospect hasn't really gotten a lot. What we have gotten in the last several, I would say in the last couple of weeks is new roads. We still have major flooding. So we have to do a district council that puts the people back in charge of making decisions. It's the one thing that I think politicians forget. They only really rely on these folks when it comes to getting back in. 
So in, within my first 100 days, the first thing that we need to do is establish a democratically elected district council from the wider prospect. Mr. Austin is also right. Prospect is more than Victor Avenue. Prospect is more than Marina Drive. Prospect is vast. Prospect have thousands of people in it, and we need to cater to everyone. The next project that we have to do, we have to address flooding. As I canvassed, I've knocked on every door in Prospect just about, and the number one issue that people are dealing with is flooding. So we have to address that. We also have things like crime. But what we've been trying to do is address crime in a vacuum. And I've said for many, many years, all of these reports prove it. You cannot address crime just on Victor Avenue or on Poindexter. You have to address crime at a national level. It's not going to evaporate because we put a couple of police on standby. It's not going to do that. So part of this process is making sure that people are coming together through a district council in addressing things like crime and things like flooding. And from that, we have to then approach the government because when I get into parliament, I want to have 2,000 people behind me. I don't want to be the lone wolf in parliament. We have to have more people there. Thank you. Mr. Harris, the same question. Thank you very much. Um, I stand for re-election in Prospect on a plan for a cleaner, greener, safer Prospect. Cleaner, certainly it might to continue my commitment uh, to ensure the collection of trash, both on the major roadways as well as the inner communities, working with the communities on annual cleanups, but also perhaps amending the trash laws to make it easier to find individuals, the establishment of trash wardens, so that we can continuously uh, keep our neighbourhood looking clean um, not re relying entirely on DEH for the uh, weekly traffic pickups or the annual pickups that occur. Greener, I would like to see us develop more open public spaces. Uh, under the current administration, uh, together with the representative for Red Bay, uh, we've developed the Prospect Red Bay Park. And it's still under completion. We anticipate it will be completed, uh, hopefully, uh, in the later years of 2021 this year. Um, there is also a number of public open spaces included in every subdivision. I would like to encourage, whilst park development has been high on the priority list for residents, I would also like to see us develop perhaps a community farm working with the De Department of Agriculture so that we can feed our communities uh, as well as keeping it greener. Safer communities, obviously crime continues to be an issue. I disagree with my colleague, uh, Mr. Miles, when he said nothing has been done in prospect save a few roads. Um, yes, Prospect has had a number of roads resurfaced, but Prospect has also had the most light poles installed on both major roads and community roads than any other constituency in all 19 constituents. That, of course, removes dark corners, lightens them up, makes communities safer. Uh, improved roads, better lighting, certainly I agree completely. A major flood water drainage program is needed, particularly for Prospect proper in between Marina and Mangrove. Um, that project is going to be a costly one. That project will mean more inconvenience before uh, it is alleviated. But I have established relationships and spoken with the NRA. And if re-elected, that certainly will be a major capital project that I will support. Thank you. Ms. Turner? Very interesting to hear my two colleagues talk about what they want to accomplish that has actually been attained on the backs of the people based on the NPO organization that was established by the residents of the Red Bay Prospect Community Group. If my two colleagues were more involved with the group that was established by the back of the people, they would have understood and know that the catchment area actually starts from Selkirk Drive and goes east to the Spots Newlands Road. Because of our limited and the size of our um, board, which is only six people, um, we were able to, we were not able where manpower was concerned to head further east. However, my colleague, Councillor Harris, is very active on the community group chat. He is on both chats, and he copies and he's pasted all, the, all of the, the information that is shared with the wider community with his constituents. But failure to inform the residents because of the backs of the people's ability to have the manpower to push it for, working with your elected officials is key. He failed in that, in, that, in that part, in letting his constituents know uh, that there is a group that exists. But put all of that aside, I just want to set the record straight that we're not limited 
to just a small part of Prospect. It goes east to the Spots Newlands Road. I intend to deal with traffic. We have done that. We have done that robotically by the Prospect Chat. We have volunteered as residents to assist with the police, even out at the Red Bay Primary School. And this collaboration was, again, all through this WhatsApp chat. Flooding. We will go more into that because I'm quite sure that is also a national issue, too, that we will address. Um, that is something that I've advocated for as um, leader of the CERT and being part of has hazard management. And community enhancement. I will continue to even excel that much more with the continued buy-in of the residents within the Prospect and Red Bay constituency. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harris, I ask you to start with the responses on this next question, which moves more from constituency to national issues. Uh, there are several national issues obviously facing our three islands. Please identify one or two issues that you wish to champion when elected. Uh, certainly. Thank you for the question. I'll identify three. Uh, now that we're <laughs> transitioning from managing the COVID pandemic to recovering from it, the three top national issues to me, certainly if re-elected, are employment and social welfare. Uh, I take them as one thing because I believe they go hand in hand. Uh, certainly this government has a track record of delivering the lowest unemployment of any government in decades. Certainly COVID-19 came along and put a, I think, a monkey wrench in those plans. But the same government that got us the lowest unemployment can certainly do it again. Likewise, uh, as a government and certainly as councillor, parliamentary secretary for community affairs, I'm quite proud on what we've been able to deliver on the social welfare side. On the height of COVID pandemic, we were assisting 13,000 people, uh, keeping them fed, keeping them clothed, keeping them housed. Um, but I will acknowledge that there are gaps in social welfare. That we need to ensure that the right people get the right help at the right time. And certainly I will look at uh, certainly restructuring the delivery of social welfare. Reducing the cost of living. We are a product of the cost of living we have because of the demands that the people of this country place on our standard of living. The cost of living is reflective of that. However, I do have a plan to reduce the cost of living and I look forward to answering that question if asked in this forum. Uh, finally, reducing traffic. Reducing traffic is the number one issue amongst constituents and prospect, but it is also a national issue. In 2019, I moved a private member's motion to form a committee to look specifically at that. It was approved unanimously, unanimously by the then Legislative Assembly. Between 2019 and 2020, I chaired a committee together with my colleague David White and members of the private sector, and we came up with 10 solid recommendations on how to improve traffic. Again, I have a plan. That plan, unfortunately, when the House dissolved, so too did the opportunity to introduce that plan. But I'm happy to say the Cabinet accepted that plan, and if elected in 2021, I will implement that plan as a matter of priority. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Ms. Uh, Ms. Turner? Um, quite um, a resounding sound, Most, mostly where traffic is concerned, um, education and going into more uh, uh, community development. I'll break it down um, as quickly as possible with the limited time given, um, because I'm quite sure this will come back up again. When you look at the traffic, Prospect has had numerous for years complaints about persons cutting into the inner roads, therefore causing backlogs and backups into the immediate community for years. As a community group, we've championed and we've been willing to work with the traffic department in order to try and alleviate that. Um, so this is one of the issues where the inner roads are concerned that we will deal with on a localized. But from a national level, we need to really look at the importation of motor vehicles. And I would advocate for no importations that are older than five years. I would consider also looking at legislation in that is similar to Bermuda, where newcomers to our shores are not able to purchase or license or import a vehicle for at least six, six months to a year. I can go deeply deeper into this, but I want to also look at education. Availing ourselves to the resources that, within, that are within our community, using those and making sure that we can actually deal with um, utilizing all of our persons and upskilling our, our people by using those skill sets uh, within the schools in the evenings and create, it takes a village to raise a child. And our biggest asset and our biggest investment are our children and our people. I feel that the assets are there, the resources are there. We can use our retired teachers and, and persons with skill sets where VTEC 
is concerned and um, digital age and, and provide that free of cost to two persons now using Prospect as a pilot and eventually rolling that out on a national level for the future. It is, it will be free and we incentivize and give stipends to those who will avail themselves and share their expertise, but in the evenings. Thank you. Mr. Miles. I have five leadership priorities, but I'll only mention three because of time constraints. The first one for me is cost of living. We have a grossly um, high cost of living. The majority of Caymanians can't afford it. For four years, we've done very little. What we've done is try to build our way out of it. Mr. Austin mentioned that we have 13,000 people on welfare. That is not an accomplishment. That's disgusting. And prior to him taking office, we talked about that for quite a bit. COVID-19 didn't cause poverty. COVID-19 exasperated it. We've always had it. So 13,000 pe 13, people being on NAU is the most ugliest thing that we have done in our country because we didn't have welfare like this. So part of this process is ensuring that NAU is reformed. It's one of the things that we have to do. We have a poor relief law that says absolutely nothing. And in order to reduce poverty, we have to reform the law because we have to start to get people back to work. But people have to get involved, not from the $6 an hour level. We have to start to retool and retrain. And it's the reason why I implemented Inspire k -Man Training out of my own pocket. Because after working in education for 10 years, I recognized one thing. The gap that Ms. Dawson is talking about is a 30-year gap. It's not a four-year gap. We could have fixed education a long time ago. So in order to address cost of living, we have to make sure that our people are trained better. Healthcare is another one that I have, I've exhausted myself talking about because we have so many of our people that can't afford it. And even if they can, they have plans that, do, that, that absolutely do not cover them. We have to start to either look at subsidized health care through the government, or we have to look at universal health care. But we've also kicked that can down the road. We have aging civil servants that's going to be on government health care for a long time. And then we have the majority of our people Thank that you. are part of the health care gap. So Thank you, Michael. those are the two major things. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Turner, we'll start with you for the next question here. Today, there was a government press briefing announcing a change in the quarantine protocol. What are your views on the current approach to reopening our borders? Mr. Moderator, that is definitely a question of critical importance, and I am happy that we are making strides with lessening uh, the amount of quarantine time that is required for those uh, persons who, uh, residents and visitors who want to visit our shores. <coughs> but when you, my immediate household, and the reopening of our borders is one thing to think about. I have family members that have been adversely affected. My husband is working in the hospitality industry and other family in the tourism sector. We need to reopen. I see and I share the fear and the sense of hopelessness that people are, are, are experiencing because of the closure. But we also need to do and, and place, you know, strict conditions, making sure that we do not become like our neighbors, where Jamaica alone in 24 hours had 275, two, 725 positive cases. When we look at the target market in which we're, we're attracting tourism from, they haven't sorted it out. We have to look at what it could cost and we have to look at the major implications, these, the, the COVID itself is playing on mutation with the, with the vaccine. People visiting our shores, are they going to comply with our laws for the sacrifices that we have made? Being a nurse and working in the healthcare, these people have been going like crazy from 2019. Do we want to take that risk? It has to be calculated. It has to be pragmatic. It has to be an approach that we have to take it step by step, but not forgetting the persons that are adversely affected. We need to continue to help them, but making sure that we have control. We also have to ensure, ensure that Travel Cayman is properly resourced so that they can manage 
and to mitigate any challenges that may that may um, may face them in order to take us to this new phased open because it's something that we're still learning about. Thank you, Mr. Miles. The same question. I think one of the um, challenges that we've always had is we use the private sector when it's out of convenience for us, and I think reopening have to include the private sector, uh, the, the private sector. The Chamber of Commerce, for, for example, have many, many, many different members that provide hundreds if not thousands of jobs. What we've done is a great job up until this point. Now it's now time to move on. Yes, we are gonna continue to vaccinate, but as Sabrina just mentioned, we have a lot of people that's hurting and we now have to start to look at a phase reopening process. We have other markets that we can tap into. The U.S. isn't the, the, the U.S. and Canada isn't the only market. So we have to start to look beyond the beyond North America, as it's raging. It's 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 still quite raging there. One of the things that I took part in several uh, just last year was understanding what we could be doing during COVID. I think we've also missed a great opportunity to implement the national energy policy to ensure that we did not have to rely so heavily on the tourism sector. We could have retrained hundreds, if, if not thousands of our people, because it, had we had done that, a lot of our people would not be either unemployed or underemployed at this point. So while we have to look at this phase reopening process and certainly hope to God that the U.S. gets their um, shop in order, we should now be spending a lot more time investing in retooling and reskilling. Our construction market is still major. We know that if we could, with some integrity, we can implement the national energy policy, we would have created a lot of jobs by now, and we, we could have at least moved the country forward financially, especially with our most vulnerable. Thank you. Mr. Harris. Thank you very much for the question. Before answering it, I want to address some comments made by my opponent, uh, Ms. Sabrina, on the issue of traffic and what was community-driven and certainly what was representative-driven. Uh, while she's absolutely correct, um, I listen to the cries of the people of Prospect through the various WhatsApp groups, whether it be the one that existed or the four that I created after being elected. But for years, traffic has been plaguing Prospect, falling on deaf ears. I came along and I listened. Uh, closing Poindexter Road to uh, local traffic didn't happen as a result of volunteer effort, but came as a result of representative pressure and working with the RCIPS. Uh, to the question, um, the statement raised by my opponent, Mr. Miles, in terms of the number of persons, 13,000 at the height of COVID receiving social welfare, that was at the height of COVID after we closed the borders and persons certainly in tourism, financial and, and, and other industries couldn't go to work. 2019, we talked about the lowest unemployment the Cayman Islands had ever experienced. What that means in plain English was in 2019, 98% of the overall population had a job. 95% of them were Caymanians. So certainly COVID exasperated that problem and, you know, it's a reality. Um, I think on average, um, prior to COVID, there were about 6,000 persons on social welfare. Still not a proud number, but I also want to point out that this group consists of persons who are elderly, retired, no longer working again, as well as persons with disability. They probably will never be able to hold down consistent employment, but they still need help. And thank God NEU and social welfare was there. As it relates to the opening, uh, I'm happy that uh, we've been able to reduce the quarantine time. This is representative of the government's disciplined approach to vaccination, which now we're at 90% of the high risk category. Uh, and that's good. The government is seeking to achieve herd um, uh, herd resistance, I forget the term for it, but certainly herd resistance by getting vaccinated, protecting our local population. But we cannot open too soon. The last thing this country needs is to move into a second lockdown. So we have to be careful. We have to follow the science. But of course, uh, keeping the borders closed indefinitely is simply unsustainable. And I would agree, reopening is necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next question uh, has already been touched on by a, a number of you is relates to the cost of living. This was actually the top issue in the Chamber's recent survey. And so we, what I'm looking for is, is what specific measures would you recommend to help reduce or alleviate the cost of living for all residents in the Cayman Islands? Uh, and Mr. Miles, if we could start with you on that question. 
one of the first things that we have to look at is our minimum wage. We've kicked this down the road many times. We have a high percentage of our population that are making minimum wage. Therefore, we have needs assessment unit that's subsidizing hundreds, if not thousands, of these people. Ms. Dawson talked about 6,000 people. A lot of those people are not elderly. We capture all of these statistics. So a lot of these folks are able to work, are working, but cannot afford to pay their bills. When we have people that are looking for simple things as food, we have an issue. So we have to certainly address the, our minimum wage. Another thing that we need to address is huge developers coming into our country, throwing on a lot of concrete, making a lot of money, and moving on. We have to start to look at them contributing to things like schools, parks, the cleanup of our cemeteries, roads, playing fields, all of these green spaces that we consistently talk about, we have to start to have our developers who are making a lot of money in our country put those things in order as well. Sewage system, we could have had major developers fix the flooding in Prospect years ago. What we've done, we've talked about trickle-down economics. Another area is dealing with off-reg. We have to start to regulate off-reg because too many of our people are paying high utility bills. We have to make sure that off-reg follows through with implementing the national energy policy. We have to look at things like solar and renewables. There should be solar on every government building, every school in our country. It could create jobs. It's been proven. That's why we've written the national energy policy. And in the last four years, we've, we've implemented 2% of that. So those are things that I will be looking at to implement when I'm elected. Thank you. Mr. Harris, same question. Thank you for the question. Uh, first off the bat, minimum wage will not lower the cost of living. You make more, you spend more, the supermarket increases their prices, landlords increase their rent. It is a simple fact of life. Um, minimum wage is important, but certainly if we're thinking about increasing it to the $15 levels that I hear uh, talked about, it will do exactly the opposite for cost of living. There are a number of ways in which we can reduce the cost of living, but I want to look specifically at what I consider the low-hanging fruit. What is the single largest debt or uh, the average family faces on monthly expenditure? If you're home, uh, if you have a family, it's your mortgage. Uh, mortgage, the average mortgage per person, per family is about $2,700. That's a big chunk out of an individual's earning monthly earnings, but that amount is reflective of the rates in which banks lend its money to. There is no regulation on lending rates in this country. Banks have the selective choice to charge you prime plus two, prime plus one. If you're lucky, you have a, you're a good client with a lot in the bank account, maybe you get prime minus one. But that restrictive lending rate is in fact increasing the cost of living and taking money out of people's pockets. Thankfully, the government reinvigorated a program called the GG HAM, Government Guaranteed Home Assistance Mortgage. And it seeks to address the primary concern that banks have in lending you money. That is risk and your ability to pay it back. Under the GG HAM, uh, the government agrees to guarantee 33% of that mortgage risk. I believe the government could be convinced to increase that to as much as 50%, reducing half of the risk to the bank. I believe with that kind of environment, the banks are more willing to offer reasonable rates to our citizens, those who wish to have home ownership. That puts more money in their pocket. That money they can either put back into their homes or perhaps use as voluntary contributions to make up on their pensions, which certainly took a hit as a result of COVID as well, but certainly at a timely hit as well. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Turner. Cost of living. Now, that is not going to be easy with the worldwide pandemic that we're now facing. Given, in fact, and is specific to our jurisdiction, 80% of what we consume is imported. So from the get-go, we are importing inflation. When you look at even going into cost of living, the inability for affordable home ownership, that is also impacted by inflation. 
We need to look at legislation where foreigners or expats come and they buy 10 hundreds of acres of land and just sit on it for it to then appreciate. You sell that then for a gain, that it's further pushing our Caymanians out and, and not being able to um, then purchase or be able to access affordable housing. Legislation needs to be put in place that even if that is indeed the case, that these developers and purchasers of land have to develop them within two years, but they just can't sit on it. Um, when you look at even dealing with the Bankers Association and lobbying, we're hearing more now about compound interest. This is something that we're just learning. We, we get in, you go to school, you learn to get a good education, start a family, get a home. This is all compounded in a circle with a number of factors that play in. When you go to the, to the bank for a commercial loan, they give you seven and a half years. The interest rates are not flexible. Who's lobbying for us? A lot more can be done and it will all balance out itself at the end of the day. But we have to take a, a look at home own, land ownership. We cannot continue to allow foreign persons to come out here and just buy land, hold it, let it appreciate, and then we, who are we building for? There's no longer access, but it's, it's a number of factors that is playing into cost of living. And if we just work, work it all out collectively, it will all even out itself at the end of the day. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, candidates. We've gone through five questions, some interesting questions coming up. So we're, right now we're going to take a short commercial break. Please stay tuned. Behind everything we do is a promise. Better. Better because we care. Because we all have a common goal. To be better at cooking. To be better at eating right. And taking care of ourselves. To live in a better community. To just feel better. Today and tomorrow and the next day. Do it for you. Do it for them. Do it to prove something to yourself. Do it to carry on a family recipe. Or just because. But when you aim for the stars, better just works. We're fosters. And we're better. Because of you. Because of them. Because of this place. And because we care. Here in the Cayman Islands, the private sector is the prosperity engine that drives the country forward. Just like a real engine, the better we understand how it works, the better we can make it run, and the better off we'll be. To help illustrate how our economy works, let's take a step back in time to when there were only a few thousand people living in Cayman. In those days, most people survived by fishing or farming for food. It was a simple, wholesome life, but it was a lot of hard work. Most people bought what they needed from their neighbors. As people bought and sold things, their individual wealth went up or down. But the overall wealth of the country stayed the same. In a simple economy like this, the only way one person could increase their wealth was by reducing someone else's. In order to increase the overall wealth of the country, one of our Caymanian ancestors would have to sell something, a product or service, to someone somewhere else and bring that money back home. In other words, we would have to export something. In those days, our biggest export was labor. Men worked overseas or on the seas and brought the money home, thereby increasing the total wealth of the country. Although the economy is much bigger and more complex today, these same principles still apply. Every time a company in Cayman sells a product or service to a customer overseas, the overall wealth of the country increases. Once it's here, it flows around the local economy between the government, the people, and the companies and becomes a part of our society's wealth. The two biggest sources of income for our economy today are financial services and tourism, often called the pillars of our economy. Tourists come here and spend their money. 
So all of the tourism companies like hotels, restaurants, buses, Stingray City Tours that make sure our visitors have a great time are helping to increase the wealth of our country. Just like tourists, clients of financial services firms come here and spend money too. So all of our financial service companies like insurance companies, fund administrators, lawyers, and accountants that facilitate investment transactions for people and companies around the world bring money into the economy and increase the overall wealth. The point is, if we want to increase the prosperity of our country, the best way to do that, in fact, the only way to do that, is to grow the private sector. In particular, the companies at the front lines that bring the wealth here from overseas in the first place. In the next video, we'll talk a little about how money moves around the economy. For now, thanks for watching. And remember to share this video with your family and friends so they can learn more about our economic prosperity engine. Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Canada's Forum for Prospect. I'll turn it over to Treasurer Colin Robinson, who will be posing the next question, which deals with ministerial position. Thank you, Will. And Mr. Harris, you'll start with this question. Which ministry or position in the new government would best suit your skills and why? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, certainly the present ministry in which I am responsible for minus, minus about four subjects. Uh, the subject specifically, employment, border control, and community affairs. Um, I believe I'm most suited for them because certainly upon taking office, uh, I had to work with the ministry, the administrators who actually uh, move the needles and bring the improvements, or whether it be uh, those that worked in employment, certainly the uh, restructuring of uh, the employment law, the immigration process, separating border control uh, from labor was an essential first step. Uh, but there is still a great deal of work yet to be done. Likewise, uh, community affairs, it's a privilege to work with not one, but two absolutely strong women in the leadership capacity of both chief officer and deputy chief officer. Um, again, I believe that as we move from the management stage to the recovery stage, uh, employment is important. Getting that employment to Caymanians, extremely important. Um, whilst again, we've had successes in employment, the lowest we've ever seen in decades in this country, COVID certainly escalated those problems. We need to get back on track, and certainly I believe I have the wherewithal, wherewithal in the last four years and the relevant experience to address it. Likewise, at the community uh, affairs level, community service, social welfare, I believe as we improve employment opportunities, we decrease demand on social welfare. But I agree with my colleague, Michael Miles, uh, it's more than just jobs. Uh, we have an outdated poor persons relief, relief law, which is insulting to persons who are in poverty, frankly, by its very name. Uh, during the past four years, we have been working to repeal that legislation and replacing it with more updated financial assistance legislation. Again, we ran out of time, but the good news is we have a plan and we're ready to implement it upon re-election. These ministries are not sexy and glamorous, but I believe they are essential. I volunteered to serve these ministries in 2017, and certainly if re-elected uh, on April 14th, and if there's an opportunity to be a member of the government, I would seek a ministerial seat in these roles because I believe they are essential to our recovery. Thank you. Ms. Turner? I am very passionate about people and um, working on the ground for so many years, Ministry of Community Affairs and Gender and Culture would definitely be where my heart is. Understanding resounding cry for more women, and I feel that over the years, with this less representation that we've had at our legislative arm and now our parliament, that bringing that female skill set will represent the needs of our female in having the ability to work within that ministry. When you look at um, the needs and uh, policies and why you are elected into into office, you are there to create laws and policies and work in a collaborative effort with all the staff, including chief officers, for, to, for the betterment of the people who use those services and the country as a whole. I am all about empowering, giving people a hand up and re helping them to get back on their feet so there's never a need to constantly be able to have their hands out uh, for government assistance. We're there in order to, to lend and walk with them hand by hand culture. 
I feel that I would be a great asset to this because I enjoy working with the cultural of arts. I have volunteered my time for years working in our in our Pirates Week and, and trying to maintain what we have as our heritage. And I feel that 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 homegrown, authentic part of me will only shine if I'm given that that opportunity to make sure that our culture is not only celebrated on Pirates Week, but it's also a permanent part in our curriculum so that we know where we're coming from and where we're going. Thank you. Mr. Miles? Thanks for the question. There's two ministries that I believe that should be joined at the hip. The Department of Children and Family Services and Education. I've worked in both. They deal with the same clients. I believe that these two ministries should be, or these two departments should be under the same ministry. Here's why I believe this. Because we're dealing with the same clients, we're duplicating services. Education is dealing with it from an education standpoint. The Department of Children and Family Services are dealing with it from a social standpoint. It's the same thing. If we can bridge those two ministries, we save money because we're, we're forcing key departments to work together. We have to start to look at employing the best teachers in the world. We cannot continue to build big buildings. It's not working. Clifton Hunter costs us $110 million. John Gray, before it's all said and done, it's going to cost us $160 million. And yet both of these two schools have not been successful in passing an inspection. I've been at Hope for four years. The things that I have said in education, I took to Hope Academy, and Hope is one of 12 schools who have gotten good on their last inspection. Why? Because we followed the breadcrumbs. Again, I point to my binder here. I chart on my shoulder because we know all of the recommendations. We don't need to recreate this stuff. If we can implement these things, everything in terms of healthcare and unemployment goes away. All we have to do is implement it with integrity. The long and short of ensuring that all of this stuff is done is that it saves us money and heartbreak down the line. What we have done is we've kicked it down the line. So I believe that if we can get really serious with building a better education system and not just buildings, protecting our people so they're not falling into poverty, we are going to have a phenomenal country. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Turner, this next question will be for you to uh, respond to first, and this moves into the area of financial services. Uh, given that financial services is critical to the island's economy, if elected, how would you respond to the recent FATF grey listing and the EU's intention to blacklist us, even though we have met most of their requirements? I think that that is... We're not given enough attention, in all honesty, for the role in which our financial services plays. During this COVID, that is what has kept us alive. The fact of us not going on a blacklist has allowed this country on a gray list to recoup or to have made 30 to $50 million. I feel that when you look even in the financial services, there's nothing called a minimum wage. We need to make sure that at the end of the day, we hire, retool, and train our persons to protect our financial services because the income that our country makes from what those persons who are attractive in doing businesses, business with us in our hedge funds and all of that, we can only gain from that. I will repeat, there is no minimum wage positions within our financial services, and therefore, what we need to do is to be ahead of the curb. People are attracted to our jurisdiction because of the robust and respected uh, legislation that we have in place. We can no longer just pretty much flippantly say, oh, let the EU go away. We have to make sure regulations and compliance is here to stay. We need to increase and improve our level of um, infrastructure, where communication is concerned in order to be, if not the best in the world, the best in the region when it comes to internet. We're going to a digital era. Financial service is a key pillar along with tourism, and you look at what they're capable of bringing. We just need to be a little bit more fast in reacting and instead of having to be subjected to sanctions. 
bearing in mind a number of our clients international want to do business here, but they also have to comply with EU's regulations. So that is a key thing. And I, what I want to stick home here today is the fact that there are no minimum wage positions in our financial services. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Miles, same question. We always seem to be shocked when this topic comes up. And I always feel that we're always backpedaling. I believe that the Cayman Islands is the best country in the world. I love this country. I, I, I have represented this country for 30 years at various different levels. But we always seem shocked when the EU or, or some other entity comes at us. And yet we have the best talent in the world in the private sector that we underutilize. We only seem to tap into these people when there's a pandemic or when there's something else. Why aren't we putting the best team of people together? We have the best law firms in this country. We have the best law firms in the globe, but yet we don't utilize these people. We should now be expecting that this is gonna happen all the time. So let's assemble the best people. So they are protecting us on the front line. I believe that if we're not doing that, we're failing everyone in this country. And one of the biggest things that I've seen is that government seem to always be shocked that we're in a blacklist, not expect that, you know something, they're gonna come with us. Another thing that I see that we have to do different is we have to start to attack it from the front lines. We have to start to put it out there that we are actually abiding by the standards of the EU. We are um, uh, um, uh, abiding by the standards of the US, by Canada or wherever. We cannot have this consistently come into our doorstep and then we are trying to fight it from there. It's too costly um, at this point. So those are things that I would put in place. The best possible people on the front line and many of those people are in the private sector and we have to start to look at how we fund that. So there should be a separate fund so we're not breaking the country just and defending it in the court system. Thank you. Mr. Harris. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, the government is shocked to be on another gray list or a black list because a great deal of work certainly was spent in the last four years amending legislation in order to avoid this. Um, the EU blacklisting uh, that is expected, I think there's pretty much an assurity. We are in no taxation jurisdiction and a lot of European communities view no taxation as harmful in general. So I believe the EU blacklisting is very subjective, very politically based. Um, and we're going to have to, you know, swim against the tide in that environment. Uh, the FATF gray listing, in truth, it identifies another gap that exists within financial services, and in particular, how we punish those who break our otherwise stringent financial regulations and guidelines. You know, sometimes it takes, you, you, sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees because you're immersed in it. Uh, and again, in this case, the gray listing identifies a gap, a legitimate gap, uh, that the government has been swift to plug. Um, in terms of how do we combat it, yeah, the natural reaction is frustration. The natural reaction is, yes, let's go on the offensive. But with the recent turmoil in Europe, the separation of Brexit, now is not the time for little bitty Cayman Islands to see itself going to war against the EU or FATF. Uh, what needs is patience and discipline and further collaboration. But also, uh, and I agree with my colleague when we say that we need to tell our own story. How we do that, we need a presence in Europe. We need a financial services office for the Cayman Islands in Europe. We need an office of the Cayman Islands in Washington, D.C. We need an office for financial services in Asia so that we can tell the story that we are amongst the best regulated financial services centers in the world. And I believe that will work, lend itself to removing us from the blacklisting and graylisting than anything we do. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Miles, the first question to you. Do you believe that we can strike a balance between development and the environment? If yes, how would you attempt to achieve this balance? I mentioned um, in several of my comments that we have, we've implemented, I believe, one of the best documents in paper, the National Energy Policy. It lays it all out. We haven't put it in place. We have allowed Offreg to cherry pick what they want to implement it. We've allowed organizations like CUC to basically dictate what they're gonna do and what they're not. The balance just yes, have to be striked. 
But I also believe that government holds the key in order to implement the national energy policy. It gives so many different things that we could be doing. Renewables, we know that renewables are now the focus of many development countries. It creates jobs. We know that we need to start removing cars. What we have been trying to do is build more roads, but allow more cars in. And it's contradictory to what we want out of this. We should start to look at, you know, how do we get less cars in and develop a public transportation system? We haven't looked at that yet, right? So, but the national energy policy talks about all of this. In the last four years, and again, Mr. Austin's been part of the coalition government. He implemented the 2017 law with all of the rest of the coalition members. And we've only managed to implement 2% of that policy in four years. And I think it's sad. I think that the people of this country deserve a lot more. And yes, we can always say, well, there was a pandemic. Yeah, but there was a pandemic in their last year, right? There was a pandemic over four years. They could have done a lot more to implement the national energy policy because it would have created more jobs, good jobs, good paying jobs for our people. A major part of this right now is the balance is already there. I don't need to strike it. I don't need to recreate it. What I need to do is make sure that the government's held accountable for it. Let's create, let's implement the national energy policy. Thank you. Mr. Harris? Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, I believe we can strike a balance, and I believe we do all of the time. Uh, certainly, we have a vibrant national conservation law that is run by an even more vibrant and certainly um, not shy National Conservation Council, oftentimes disagreeing with government, particularly in its development plans. Um, we have the power of petition and referendum that we saw certainly during the cruise birthing uh, development conversation. When people feel strongly enough that an environment or an asset is important to them, they will inform the government and through any one of the existing mechanisms, we can strike that balance. But we have to look at it subjectively and carefully as to what is our greatest priority. And I give roads and traffic as an example. The east-west arterial, better known as the Prospect Bypass, has in fact been developed. We pushed past Hearst Road. The plan is to take it all the way into Frank Sound. Right now, we've pushed into the woodland areas, but we're stopped because we, the, the National Conservation Council wants us to conduct an environmental impact assessment. Flora and fauna are important, but so too are people, commerce, and lives. When children in East End and North Side have to wake up at 5 a.m. to catch the bus to go into town to start a school day because otherwise, to do otherwise would mean being late to school, we have a problem. When we talk about moving some of the services to, to the East, what dictates cost of those services is the time it can be delivered to the consumer. If everything is in, in, in Georgetown, certainly we will never see development in the outlying areas. Roads are an example of where we have to draw a line in this community in terms of what is important. Yes, there will be losses, but I believe we have proven through the methods that I have already uh, stipulated that we do achieve a balance more often than not. Thank you. Ms. Turner? Being able to strike a balance is definitely something that is attainable, but we honestly have to have the real genuine conversation. When we look at the amount of development and uh, what is happening in our environment, are we ready to sit down and have the real conversations and dealing with legislations that in order pause this? Is it development that's happening wise? Who is it for? How are we incorporating our environment and the impact that it will have on future generations, that is key. If we're only looking at the almighty dollar, yet our people are being left behind, environment becomes second class, then we will have no planet and nothing for our young, uh, for our children to, to be able to aspire and live in. We need to stop looking at the almighty dollar. Now's the time to pause and make sure that a, a sustainable uh, development um, and, and just getting that whole narrative that that formula work out. We have some serious development happening right now in Prospect and without proper legislation in our land laws where water has to be contained within the land, 
not, not enough infrastructure is put in, and we are going to have a disaster on our hands if development that is approved does not include infrastructure and, and infrastructure works of the developers and stop leaving the people of this country saddled with roads and proper runoff drainage. These are the real conversations that needs to be had with those who are approving all of these development. I am not anti-development. I'm smart development, but making sure that our environment is protected and that whatever development is accessible to our people. We are tired of being left behind. They, they no longer have a voice. The voice that they had is voiceless. And I am willing to be that voice for them so that our environment and development will be at our people's um, access moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harris, the next question, uh, I'd look for you to uh, respond to first. Uh, moving on to education. Uh, what do you see as being the biggest hindrance to the education system in the Cayman Islands? And how specifically would you propose to address it? Um, thank you for the question. I think the biggest hindrance to education in the Cayman Islands <laughs> right now is the parental involvement both at the PTA level as well as on a day-to-day -day basis. If we are not reinforcing what we are teaching in our schools eight hours a day in our homes at night, we are always going to have poor grades, poor inspection results, and otherwise disappointing outcomes. Um, I give you an example of how parental involvement works, and I'll use the Prospect Primary School as that example. We have a very vibrant uh, and committed PTA, a number of parents uh, participating all of the time. Uh, these same parents are checking their child's homework. So if your child's having difficulty in science or math or English, if you are participating at home with that child, you'll identify that early and you'll be able to address it either through tutoring or additional assistance. Um, the biggest issue and the gap for education in, Pro in Prospect Primary at this stage is expansion. We need more space. There are students, there are parents moving to Prospect. We had, I think, 171 new voters. They move to Prospect in many cases specifically to enjoy the primary school environment that Prospect Primary affords. Um, because of parental involvement, we can certainly realize what has already been done in education. Uh, the Minister for Education, uh, one of the first things she did in this present term uh, was improve the morale of teachers by increasing their pay to $5,000. Um, we certainly see uh, the new curriculum being added and continues to be rolled out more modern. I believe these two issues, these two uh, approaches will reflect positively on our school inspection results in years to come. Rome wasn't built in a day and these issues weren't, didn't happen overnight. But certainly we have a vibrant education system, but there needs to be broader parental involvement and stop blaming it on government or other things. Thank you. Um, Ms. Turner. <coughs> education. Our kids, like I said at the beginning, and education is the root of everything. But right now with this pandemic, and we've seen there's no way in our lifetime that we could ever imagine that this would happen. When we're talking about education, we need more parental involvement. We need to utilize our adults in our community, our retired teachers within our community, and there are resources there that are not being tapped into after after school classes that we could make those available and accessible at night, free of charge to those who cannot afford it. With my ability to lead, this is something that we wanted to do within the community level and with the buy-in of the people. And and, and give those persons who are willing to give up their time in the evening a stipend to incentivize them. I call it the ACE, that's Adult Continuing Education. Now, we have the schools that are there. We can teach um, all of this stuff with, the, with um, computers and, and you have the green spaces out there. It's a win-win for all, but we have to address it. We have to make sure that we get our six forms back into our public schools. I think it's a crying shame when we pass our public schools and have to take our kids to a private school when public school is there, accessible for all and it's free of cost. But we need more to take our children forward. We need more parental involvement. It takes a village to raise a child and this can only happen if all hands clap. 
I am a big proponent of mixing our children back so that they can have something to aspire. But I will fight tooth and nail to get back the sixth form and A level back into our public school system so we no longer have to pass our private school system because our education system and curr curriculum is used as a political football. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Miles. This is another football we've kicked down the way. As I said, I've been in education for 10 years. Six of that was in the Ministry of Education. These folks don't listen. Everything that my esteemed colleagues have provided tonight about education, we could have been doing it over the last 25, 30 years. We are talking about it. Again, these are all the reports. So we have, we've inspected 54 schools. There's only one government school, which is the Lighthouse School, that have scored a good on education, good in their last inspection. But yet we spend almost $100 million on education. Here's what we have also done to our education system. I hear Sabrina talk about getting sixth form back in. But yet we have lowered the standard of education that a child can get five courses in F, E's, or G's, 90% attendance, and less than 15 days suspension, and they can get a cap and gown and we see a lot of folks up on stages shaking these kids' hands and pushing them out the door. Education cannot start from, being, from, from us having a cap and gown. Education has to start from our early childhood centers. We've done a great job in ensuring that we have an early childhood um, now that all of the early childhood centers are now regulated. What we now need to do is fund them. We can't start from first or second grade anymore. We have to start to fund early childhood centers. There's a lot more that I could say about education because it's a very large topic. But unless you're funding it from the time the child is three or four, we are not going to be successful when they're on a stage receiving a diploma that's not worth the paper it's written on. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Turner, we'll start with you with this question. Several local species of fish that we love to eat are on their way to extinction from overfishing. Will you support the enactment of the Marine Parks Expansion Plan and other DOE recommendations and increase funding to enhance marine parks enforcement so as to restore this precious aspect of our tourism attraction, food reserve, and new sand production? The immediate response to that is yes. And I must say I am humbled to have been invited to a meeting with Mr. Courtney Platt, who is an avid person when it comes to reef fish. And I understand it may be a very delicate conversation to have because we have many of our locals who depend on the fishing uh, right off our very reefs in order to provide a meal for themselves and an income to their household. But where is the data for counting the species of fish that are there? For every dive that happens, oh, there's a lot of fish. But how many, where's the data that proves the type of fish that were there? We lack sufficient information in order to make a call. But the mere fact is, is that about five or 10 years ago, legislation was passed, but it has not moved out of the consultative phase. Once I am elected, and to be the first female elected pres uh, representative in prospect, I will make sure that any legislation as it pertains to protecting those that, that initiative will be removed from a dusted shelf, no longer conversation, but in act. We have to start somewhere, but this is not to disregard those people who depend on reef fish for a living. I will have them at the forefront of my mind because I love me some fried fish and fritters, but we have to also be able to control it so that this can be enjoyed by our future generations as well. Thank you. Mr. Miles? Like Ms. Turner, I am the same. I had the opportunity to meet uh, Mr. Platt, and he laid out um, what he have seen is a dire need to, I would say, to implement legislation. He outlined the things that we can do different um, by not just um, uh, expanding the no-fish zones, but no one is listening again. I believe that we need 19 constituents uh, 19 MPs who are running constituents to take it more seriously. Like everything else, we sit down, we create committees or forums or groups, but we don't really do a lot. What Courtney outlined is serious. He's saying in the next couple of years, 
these particular air, these, these particular species of fish are going to just disappear altogether. What we have done, we're, we are saying, we're going to just think about it. We're going to look at it. So he's tuned out. He is put aside. And yet we have a huge population of fish that is now being extinct. What we have to do is not just implement regulations, implement laws. We now have to actually deal with the problem. We have to enforce it. You know, we are looking at bringing on many different facets of government. You know, we, we are now looking at saying to our country, we have the regiment, um, we, we, we have um, another line of defense that we're bringing on again um, to help the police department. Why aren't we enforcing a lot of this stuff? We have some of the best scuba divers in this world. When Courtney explained that we still don't know how many fish species there are because we've never counted those. Why aren't we using those? Why aren't we putting those people back to work? They could have been doing all of this in the last year that COVID have bring, brought our, um, our tourism system to a halt. But I support what this legislation is and, and now we have to implement it and enforce it. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Thank you for the question, and uh, certainly, um, you know, I know Courtney. I like Courtney, um, but you're entitled to your own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. A little known fact is that under the current administration and the current Minister of Environment, who also happens to be the current Minister of Health and perhaps been a little preoccupied with managing COVID to share this good news, but under the Coalition Government of National Unity, we have enhanced more marine parks across all three Cayman Islands than any government that came before us. Uh, so certainly we are uh, working to preserve the environment, to ensure that there is an important balance. Our environment plays an important role uh, in our tourism product, whether it be white sandy beaches or crystal clear waters. Um, I call it my, my opponent mentioned diving, certainly another major industry in tourism, all of that ties around the marine environment itself. <clears throat> but we also have the cultural aspect. Many persons in this country fish to feed their families, whether it's two fish a night or more on a commercial basis. I believe what threatens our marine environment and species of fish uh, isn't overfishing, but in fact the uh, ever-present threat of the invasive lionfish uh, that eats everything in its path. I think we have more concerns about that than we have in overfishing. Uh, the same Minister of Environment also this month, this month uh, signed finally signed the remediation contract for the landfill, which of course we've known for years also continues to threaten our marine environment by leachate into the marine waters. The plans that are in place, the actions taken by this uh, present administration work proactively to improve this point, to improve and preserve our uh, natural environment, but again, um, we have to balance that with our culture. Thank you. Well, thank you, candidates. Ten questions down, several more to go. So please stay tuned. We'll be right back after these short commercial breaks. Behind everything we do is a promise. Better. Better because we care because we all have a common goal, to be better at cooking, to be better at eating right, and taking care of ourselves, to live in a better community, to just feel better. Today and tomorrow and the next day, do it for you, do it for them, do it to prove something to yourself, do it to carry on a family recipe, or just because. But when you aim for the stars, Better just works. We're fosters. And we're better. Because of you. Because of them. Because of this place. And because we care. In the last episode, we learned about the important role of companies here in Cayman that do business with overseas customers and generate new wealth for the Cayman Islands economy. But what about all the other companies in the Cayman Islands? How do they fit into our prosperity engine? Every business in the Cayman Islands falls into one of three groups, or tiers. 
Each tier plays a critical role in our economy. The first tier is made up of all the companies that do business with overseas customers and bring money into our economy. Companies in this tier are like the gas tank of our economic prosperity engine. The more we have in the tank, the farther we can go. Although most well-known companies in this tier are in financial services like Butterfield Bank or tourism like the Ritz-Carlton, there are many other well-known tier one companies doing business with overseas customers like Unit Registry, Health City, and all of the companies in Cayman Enterprise City. The second tier of the economy is all the companies that do business with other local companies, like IT and marketing consultants, or companies that sell supplies to bars and restaurants. These companies are also very important because without them, the companies they supply would need to buy their goods and services from overseas. So while companies in Tier 1 bring money into our economy, companies in Tier 2 help keep it here. The third tier is made up of all the companies that provide services to people that live and work in the Cayman Islands. Companies in this tier include supermarkets, dry cleaners, mechanics, gyms, doctors, dentists, architects, house builders, florists, and gardeners. These companies are important sources of employment and business opportunities for our people. And they play a really important role because without them, Cayman wouldn't be a very nice place to live. So to recap, Tier 1 companies do business with customers overseas. Tier 2 companies do business with other companies in Cayman. And Tier 3 companies do business with those who live here. Every company and self-employed contractor in the Cayman Islands falls into one of these three tiers. And they all play an important role in making our nation prosperous, helping bring money into our country, improve our economy, and creating jobs. And without them, the Cayman Islands wouldn't be the great country that it is. Thanks for watching. And remember to share this on social media so we can all help fuel the economic prosperity engine. Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce Candidates Forum for Prospect. We'll turn to the topic of economic diversification, and President Mike Gibbs will answer that, uh, respond, uh, ask that question. Sorry. Thank you, Will. Uh, Mr. Miles, this one will be directed to you first. Um, financial services continues to come under external pressure, as we've just talked about, and tourism may never return to the levels before the, uh, seen before the pandemic. I'm wondering, what are your views about diversifying the economy and which areas would you support and encourage? We have to start looking at energy efficiency. Therefore, as I said earlier, we have to start looking at implementing faster the National Energy Plan. It's a job creator and it's good jobs. It's great paying jobs. We need technicians, right? Because it's <coughs> been going so slow, you have an entire industry who don't actually know how to plan. So they don't know from one day to another if they're gonna be in business or not. That has to change. So we have to ensure that Offreg is enforcing a lot of this stuff. Another thing that we have to start to look at is things like farming, right? We have loads of land. Dawson is right. There's public land in just about every constituency, but we are not tapping into that. Why aren't we setting up peppercorn leases with farmers within the constituencies so that we can move that throughout our country? Because of this, our food shortage could be threatened. There's going to be, a, a, God forbid, I don't wish it on our world again, but there may be another pandemic. What then? What if the food dries up because it's in demand all over the world? We have to start to get more contained within our country where we are producing our own food. I think farming is going to be a major thing here, uh, and, and not just growing stuff, but we can also create fisheries. There are so many things that we could be doing, but again, we're focused just on the financial services or banking or government administration. I also believe that another area that we have to start to focus on is the technology fields. Why aren't we inviting Google in, Facebook, why aren't we giving them some concessions to come in here? The majority of our kids are technology savvy today. Those are three major industries that we can create right off the bat that 
that doesn't include us putting down any building space, right? We have more than enough of that, right? So I believe that if we can do this, we have three solid industries that will produce a really great structures going forward. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harris. Thank you for the question. Economic diversification is absolutely essential. I think certainly during this COVID pandemic, we see, uh, first of all, how important financial services really is to the Cayman Islands. But we also can appreciate how important tourism is to the Cayman Islands, and both in terms of opportunities for employment as well as opportunities to sustain a living. Uh, certainly the government that I have been a part of for the last four years believes and embraces diversification, and, we, and it can certainly be seen in the field of healthcare. Uh, again, continuing on the positive works and actions of previous administrations that saw Health City enter the market. Uh, now we're looking to cater our services to a potential fourth, um, again, high-level care uh, hospital. That will improve the health care outcomes for our people, but also create the diversification that we need. We also see the Honourable Minister for Planning, Commerce uh, and Infrastructure, uh, Joseph Yu, uh, and the tireless efforts he has gone through in his ministry under this administration to support micro and small businesses through the development of whether it be grants or aids or certainly the development of the uh, Center for Business Development, encouraging our people to be entrepreneurs, to go out and be their own bosses, creates that kind of diversification that regular employment uh, certainly just does not. I do want to challenge the statement that you made, Mike, as it relates to the possibility that tourism may not return to our pre-COVID levels. I disagree entirely. I believe our tourism products and the offering of the Cayman Islands is extremely strong. I believe the fact that we've kept our borders closed has only caused more, pe more people to knock. I believe our success rate on COVID being the safest place on this planet in addressing COVID and not having to deal with social distancing or otherwise will serve as an encouragement. The more people are not saying you can't come in, builds that sort of desire to come to the Cayman Islands. The Cayman Islands product and tourism is number one. And I believe when we do eventually re reopen, our tourism will surpass pre-COVID levels. Thank you. Ms. Turner. Yes, my response to that is that we, I'm not going to throw the financial services under the bus. We have regulations, and regulations is a must. Transparency in protecting us to keep us attractive is here to stay. All we have to do is listen to the advice given by our experts, and there are so much of them here. The spin-off effect from what we can get from our financial services can then trickle down into being able to upskill and retool our people to make them not only local, lo local citizens, but global citizens. So that when we do get out of this and we are able to then allow our people to go internationally and they're going with skill, innovation is something that we're lacking. We can invite other industries to come here. We have created this bubble that is made after, is make us very more attractive. But in protecting our financial services, retooling and upskilling our persons within the tourism sector, when that does rebound, we should be trailblazers, have different attractions, retool and upskill. So even tourism, should this happen again? We don't know if this will be a part of our life moving forward, but we will be retooled, upskilled, and ready for the challenge in order to keep us viable and sustainable without having to depend on external forces. But I feel that our financial services is something that needs to be guarded, something that we need to protect. When you look at how much people want to, to, to come here, build our ecosystem around that, and it will all play out at the end of the day. This is who we are known for. We have it. It does not take the reinvention of the wheel, but we can actually benefit from the spin-offs in which the financial services bring where revenue is concerned, that we can share that evenly across the playing field to give our people a hand up and not a hand out. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Harris, this question is for you. What are your views on the recently enacted Civil Partnership Act? Um, thank you for the question. The Civil Partnership Act or the Domestic Partnership Law as it was called in the Legislative Assembly when it was debated and exists today, um, is about the rule of law. It's about the incompatibility 
a court of law in the Cayman Islands found with the Bill of Rights and the existing government laws. Uh, it's a particular subject, certainly one that um, I believe cost me support from a number of persons. But it represents the question, as I stated on the floor of the Legislative Assembly, that this is about the rule of law and we are a country that respects law and order. A court told us we were incompatible. What were we to do? Ignore their wishes and say, no, we don't, we disagree with you. That is not good governance. Being elected to office means exercising uh, good judgment and demonstrating leadership, particularly in difficult scenarios. Uh, the Bill of Rights, the, the, the Domestic Partnership Bill was simply about ensuring that every sector, particularly uh, those uh, either of same-sex uh, orientation or those of heterosexual uh, orientation, have an opportunity to be to have access to the same rights as otherwise married couples do. Um, whilst the bill certainly seemed to attract a lot of tension around the uh, same-sex marriage, uh, it was not intended to only address same sex. As a matter of fact, there are uh, civil unions, there are persons in this community who have been together in personal relationships for a number of years, don't necessarily believe in the institution of marriage, but they certainly have no intention of leaving each other. They should be entitled to the same rights as couples who are otherwise married, whether it be inheritance rights, insurance rights, etc. Um, and interestingly enough, despite the uproar and the attention on same sex couples, um, since this law became law, more persons of the heterosexual variety have taken advantage of this law to regularize their union, uh, man and woman. Again, the government was able to achieve a court-ordered um, duty without having to amend our constitution, without having to redefine how marriage is defined in the Cayman Islands. Um, it upheld the law and ensured rights for everyone. Thank you. Ms. Turner? Mr. Moderator, in my most humble opinion, this ship has long sailed thanks to Section 81 of our Constitution and the, the sheer lack of our elected arm being able to uphold and even give the voice of our people that ability in the House of Parliament. As such, we must pick up the pieces and live as best as we can harmoniously in this on, with each other and respect what has come down the pipelines. Now, it is uh, astounding, amazing to me, the voice of my colleague now, that he was very silent, pretty much, and the way in which, in the time, I think the climate could not have been worse. But now that Section 801 has been enacted, the people's voice was not heard. We have to be able to embrace, we will have our differences on this topic, and look, and if we have to take legislation back to tweak it, that's something we have to do. What we need to bear in mind is that we're not an independent jurisdiction. And the fact that we're still governed and we are a British, British overseas territory citizen, we still answer to our mother country, the United Kingdom. So that said, I implore each one to just love your neighbor and let's move on as best as we can. But section 81, was enacted. Thank you. Mr. Miles? I agree with Sabrina. I think 19, constitu 19 MPs failed in this matter. Section 81 should have never been enacted. I believe that 19 people should have come together and moved this through to protect our people. These are our people. Regardless of what anyone wants to think, these are our people. I, I've, I've heard all sorts of arguments. Well, it's a small uh, population of people uh, majority rules and all of that sort of stuff, they're our people. And when our people are being discriminated <coughs> against, there's a problem. And I believe that we have to protect all of our people, regardless of who they choose to be with. I don't want to beat this to death. I believe that we should have been educating our people. What I've seen is 19 constituent, 19 MPs, or at the, at the time, representatives, run into hide. They had no meetings, or if I, I think Ezra was one of the few that had a meeting to talk about this and at least bring it to the forefront, but we ran from this issue. And then we sit back and we are all upset that, the, that Section 801 was enacted by the UK that was represented by the governor. 
we have to protect our people. End and all, <laughs> we have to protect our people. So I believe that as a representative, I'm not going in just to represent heterosexuals or uh, represent this part of the community or that part of the community. I'm, I'm going to be representing everyone. Therefore, I will be out there representing everyone regardless of who their partner is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question for um, Mr. Turner to start um, is res in respect of our, our youth. What do you regard as the top two issues facing our youth of today, and how do you intend to address those concerns if elected? The two top concerns of facing our youth is pretty much hopeless, disappointment, and being able to address them, they are looking for just somebody who is a leader to give them a fighting chance. Education has failed them. I, like my colleague here, Mr. Miles, we're product of class of 1990. And we say that these children are entitled. I repeat here tonight, we were taught to go to school, get a good education, come out, start a family, and that's what we did. Our parents did the best that they could do with what little they had at their resources. And I thank them for what they have instilled in me. But in all honesty, in moving our young people forward, we have to give them a fighting chance. We need to have the difficult conversations that I messed up. I own it. Where I was eager and was able to go out at age 18 and start, get a job from 13, we have to just hold them together a little bit more. And this is where communities and NGOs can play a part in that. Right now, they are fearful. They are panicking because of not being able to get a secure job. Hopes of um, being able to own, home, own a home. They're not seeing it because of lack of education. They're seeing what struggles their parents continue to go through. And they are confused. And so are many parents. If and once the people make me their representative of Prospect, I will be their hand and foot, not only for the youth, but also their parents, because we do have a lot of young parents out there who are also searching for a leader and proper direction. But we have to do this together. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Miles. This is what's impacting youth today. Since 2000, we've commissioned almost 20 reports. This is what's impacting youth. I can talk for years about this stuff. Two things in particular that I'm working with right now is what Ms. Turner just said, poor education. It's the reason why my wife and I implemented Inspire Kim and Training. We've invested our own money. Matter of fact, we saved $50,000 because we believe in education, because of the gaps in education. I spent six years in the ministry telling them about these gaps, and I am not a teacher. Mental health is another major aspect that's also affecting the majority of our youth. COVID didn't brought this on. We have failed because the average child in our country don't have health care. For the last 10 years, I have worked tirelessly to ensure that kids are connected to mental health care, connected to resources, whether it's through NAU, through ARC, or many other facets. I myself, I have, a do I have a two daughters that have been diagnosed with a mental illness, so it impacts me in my life. But they had health care, they have access, so therefore they had treatment. I work with kids every day that do not have access to treatment. You know, I sat, I had the privilege of sitting in the Alex Banton Foundation um, Symposium. I see so many people get up and talk about this problem as if it's a new phenomenon when this is something that's been going on in our country for almost 30 years. We talk about ensuring that we have the best banks in the world, but if our children can't fill them, if our children can't fill the jobs, again, I hate to use the cliche, who are we building for? But we have to address poor education, we have to address mental health in order for us to have a better society going forward. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Uh, thank you for the question. The two top issues impacting young people in the Cayman Islands, I think, are 
um, their entrance or ab ability to access the job market after high school for those who choose not to go on to tertiary education. Um, certainly, I think we need to do a better job of uh, training our young people whilst we have them in the school system. Um, TVET is a relatively new, uh, discussed, talked about uh, uh, initiative in the Cayman Islands. It's not new to the world, uh, but certainly we have been certainly behind the eight ball in that regard. Uh, we do not, however, need new buildings to introduce TVET. Um, just last week, we saw the Public Works Department introduce uh, TVET training in construction. Uh, we have in the private sector the Superior Auto TVET program for auto mechanics. Um, when it comes down to courses, work offers, passport to success, ready to work. Um, so there are a number of programs already in existence. We just need to take advantage of them. Uh, we have brand new schools that are empty at night, classroom space that could be used for training uh, to get those who perhaps have graduated without a skill, uh, you know, upskilled in order so they can be attractive. Uh, the other issue is for young Caymanians starting out in life, uh, and that is, of course, owning a piece of the rock. Uh, whilst we're seeing a number of new developments go up, I think on Linford Pearson Highway alone, uh, we're seeing a number of developments affordable for an apartment or a condo, but not so affordable for raw land. Uh, we have to look at that. Um, I think raw land real estate prices are artificial. Um, there is no rhyme or reason to them, but they are restrictive to Caymanians wanting to own a piece of the rock. And this is areas that, you know, we have to do more uh, on. It's more than just affordable housing, but access to the Cayman dream that we have to improve on. Thank you. Thank you. This question start with Mr. Miles. Many candidates in this year's election have identified themselves as independent. If elected, would you prepare to join a coalition group or a party? If yes, which of the de declared political groupings would you be willing to align yourself? Great question. Uh, you know, I've been looking at everyone, and I'm sure that everyone's been looking at me. Um, I am all about outcomes. I'm not about rhetoric. <coughs> and I think coalitions is great to form the government. 99% of the things that I have done has been done by the people of this country. So the partnership that I'm going to develop right now is in prospect. With the 1,400 or, or, or the, 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 I would say, 2,000 um, citizens of, of, of Prospect, that's the coalition that I want to start with first. I think as we develop a government over the next two months or so, I think we're going to get loads of opportunities to see really what people want to, want to do and how they want to do that. But I believe right now what I have seen is a lot of folks talking about a lot of things and they have no clue what how they're going to accomplish those things. So currently, I'm just looking to see how, how, and, how and where I fit in into those plans. Okay, thank you. Mr. Harris? Um, I certainly think coalitions absolutely work, and we have the evidence of the existing administration, the Coalition Government of National Unity. Um, it proves that independents and independent candidates certainly do have a lot to offer, but also that they have a willingness to work with other people. Uh, this coalition government of national unity has been effective. It has delivered much. Um, and certainly it is one that I believe will lead us into the new future of politics. Um, I came to politics and was elected in 2017 as an independent, a lone wolf. And I quickly discovered that no man is an island. It takes at least one friend to move and bring a motion to the Legislative Assembly, and it takes an additional nine friends or majority to pass that motion, to bring about change. Uh, so certainly, yes, you need a team if you want to govern. Um, I remember my initial entrance into politics in 2017. We spent a week in the horse trading. The independents are great, but from a position of fact, you put 12 independents in the room, you have 12 independent agendas. 2017, fantastic example. The independents, the eight that got elected, had an opportunity to form the governor of the day, not once, but twice. But because of ego or own separate agendas, it could not hold it together. We saw the same calamity happen in the opposition during this four-year term in that struggle for leadership. Too many chiefs, not enough Indians. In 2021, I come, I stand for re-election in prospect, again as an independent,
but an independent member of the alliance, in this case, the progressive-led alliance, the only team to present a full slate of candidates, full transparency to the voters saying, you will know who our leaders will be, you'll know who our ministers will be, you will know who our backbenchers will be. So on April 14th, a vote for Austin Harris should also mean a vote for the progressive-led alliance, who I will work with if elected. Thank you. Ms. Turner? Thank you for that question. As a newcomer to the political arena, and I am authentically, originally an independent, understanding everything my colleague has just said, I am being fried in his fat because I now have to redefine the true meaning of an independent when it comes to the political arena. When you are an independent, you represent everyone and it gives you free, tr free, free ability to be clearly heard when you're actually elected. His voice has not been heard. The voice of the people has not been heard. Now, I am totally about um, working with any group of persons once the people's voice have been spoken and we know what the players are either on the night of the 14th or the 15th. Once our agendas align, but that is not without consulting the core group of who will have made me the successor of Prospect. I am all about open and being transparent. And going in, we all know that we have seen not being a part of a government, what it cannot do for you if you're not a part of the government. You have to fight that much more. Working with like-minded sets of people in order for structure is key. And yes, we understand that this would be the second time for single-member constituency. The fact of egos is not what I bring to the table. I come with a different perspective as a female, and I am willing and able to work on even footing with my male counterparts in order to take this country forward without the loss of the people's voice to which and whom they have elected to represent them. I will be not a one of the status quo, but I will be a catalyst of change in making it forward, showing that I'm able to work with any government setting personalities and egos aside and push our country and its people forward so that we're no longer falling below the poverty line and everyone benefits from the economic miracle. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harris, uh, we'll address this next question to yourself in the area of environment. What do you regard as the highest risk to the Cayman Islands natural environment and what measures would you recommend to address this risk? Without a doubt, the Georgetown landfill continues to be the single greatest risk to the natural environment. Um, I am delighted to say, though, that, as I stated earlier on, uh, the Minister of, of Environment uh, has made significant strides in this area under the current administration, uh, so much so that we, after much trial and error, much promises and failed deliveries, have been able to sign the contract for the remediation, the capping, and remediation of the Georgetown landfill. Um, I think to achieve in that endeavor would be uh, a mammoth accomplishment for the people of the Cayman Islands uh, and certainly the environment. Um, we need only be reminded of the landfill fires to see um, really what threat that landfill um, proves to the people of the Cayman Islands, not just those who live in Georgetown. Uh, the threat of fire destroys, but we don't need the fire to hurt you. The smoke itself can kill you. That smoke is being toxic. Uh, you look at the landfill today, um, it looks much better. We have, um, uh, I think, uh, toxin, toxin uh, tubing, or what, what do they call it? They're, 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 they're venting uh, the landfill to see whether or not uh, the methane can be used for waste to energy. Uh, I believe the capping and remediation of the landfill will be uh, a major um, strike in improving the natural environment. I believe the government's move towards that remediation is strong. I believe a move towards using uh, the landfill waste energy will also produce uh, lower costs of living, lower utility bills. Um, but again, the landfill didn't grow to mammoth proportions overnight. The solution will take time, but after much effort, certainly the previous administration, again, added by efforts of this administration, we are on the way to improving um, that monstrosity, and I think that's a good news. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Turner. Oh, 
measures that I would recommend is more education. Definitely, we have heard the cry of those to try and put away and decline, um, decrease our use of single-use plastics. More education, more PR on this is required. Um, collabor collaborating with the DEH in our works within the community, we try to go out and speak to as much people as possible, being creating an awareness with using that and enhancing our recycling programs. We have even volunteered to be a pilot um, when it comes to assisting with that, with that in, in the use of single single use plastics that could could um, lessen our carbon footprint. When you look at the overdevelopment and and all of the the land that is being used for construction, that is something that we also need to take into consideration because we don't have proper enforcement of laws. We have lots of laws, but under we have we are an overregulated and under enforced jurisdiction when it comes to protecting our nat natural environment. And I feel that much more attention needs to be played in this regard. More education from the school and in town hall meetings can be done so that we're all are responsible in lowering our carbon footprint from even the purchase of cars. More incentives has to be done because it all ties in at the end of the day. Thank you, uh, Mr. Miles. I would agree with, with Ms. Austin. I think that the landfill poses perhaps the greatest risk to our country. In addition, um, single, mem uh, uh, single plastic use. For 30 years, we have done reports on the landfill. I'm happy to hear that we've signed a deal to move that forward, capping that, and hopefully turning that into a recycle center. The goal, I believe, have to be done now of making sure that we follow through with it because we are a start and stop government. We start something, it looks good, we take a lot of pictures, everyone comes out to the landfill, everyone is happy, and then within a year or two, we defund it. So it goes right back to doing the same thing. The hope for me at this point in time is that we are going to be serious about recycling. We are going to be serious about uh, banning single, mem uh, single plastic usage. We've talked about it. We see it. Sabrina just mentioned that we are overregulated in terms of our laws. Yes, we are. We can spit out a law in a second. But we don't enforce anything. As we drive down, we build all of these phenomenal roads. But as you drive down those roads, they're all littered because we don't actually enforce it. And because we don't enforce it, we are constantly now having to pay the NICE program to go every year and clean that stuff up. I believe that if we are going to be serious about this, then we have to make the investment. I also believe in education. I believe that we should, we should be using social media to placade that everywhere on how important it is for us to protect our beaches, for us to protect um, our wildlife. I was just recently at um, Rum Point. As I am entering the beach, there is plastic all over the beach. There are people swimming with absolutely no care. <coughs> and I believe that we have to now ensure that it's enforced nationwide. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, Ms. Turner, you'll start. The introduction of a national lottery has been discussed for many years as a way of funding education and infrastructure. What's your view on introducing a national lottery? I have no objections with the introduction of a natural lottery as long as it is regulated. There are job opportunities there and I know personally there are a number of people that travel overseas just for that as a hobby. Now with regulations and the funds and jobs that can be created from that, I feel that our country will benefit, but not before we consult our people. This is my personal response, but should and if I am elected as the representative to, respect, to represent the people of Prospect, this is something that unanimously they would have to agree and support. But my personal view, it is something that we are, we're talking about looking at other industries. This is something that could actually bring some monies to our country's coffers, that is spin-off effect, a trickle-down effect where education is concerned, job opportunities. It could just make us another um, destined place uh, in, the, in the region for persons to come and visit our shores. Thank you. Mr. Miles? I agree with Sabrina. I, I Listen, <laughs> we've... 
We know it's happening in our country. Millions of dollars are flowing through here illegally. So we, we know. I, I've, I've, I have friends, family members that are dabbling in lottery. Why not us regulate it? Why not us ensure that we, one, we protect our people because ultimately we don't want people to get hooked and all of a sudden they're now being fed through NAU. But I believe that it can be a huge job creator and it could fund things like education, developing the, or, or protecting our environment. I also believe that the funds derived from the National Lottery should be going to training. We've been talking about skill training forever. As long as I've been alive, we've been talking about skill training, Mr. Austin touched on it earlier on about the public works program and the superior auto program. Let me make sure that people have a clear understanding of this. What government has also done with those programs is that it is optics. They're not licensed programs. My program, Kim and Career Academy, are the two only licensed programs that have gone through government. But why don't we actually license them? Why don't we expand them? Why does it have to be limited to kids coming out of SIFAC? Why not expand them? Why not put a program through this national lottery at all of our schools? He's right. We have schools sitting empty in the evenings. Why can't we use the national lottery to fund that? Why can't we use the national lottery to ensure that we're building homes for the elderly and protecting them? Or maybe we build things for our folks coming out of the prison system so their transition to the community is a lot easier. It is a different, it is a fund that we can tap into, but it's a fund that we also have to make sure that government regulates so it goes to the specific things rather than this blind check because that's what we are accustomed to as well. Thank you. Mr. Harris? Uh, thank you for the question, and I certainly would have to concur on this question with both uh, of my opponents and colleagues to my right. Ms. Turner, Mr. Miles are absolutely correct. Um, we have the numbers game in Cayman, had, had it for years. That money is going overseas whilst our people participate. Um, the lottery is a good idea. Um, it is an out-of-the-box idea. I agree it needs to be properly regulated, but it is absolutely a job creator, and we should absolutely go get on with it. We can use the proceeds for education. We can use the proceeds for job training. Uh, again, in this environment of COVID recovery, we're going to need all the assistance we can get. Government can't pay for everything out of the taxpayer's purse. And I think the lottery represents a viable way of attracting new resources that will benefit the country. Infrastructure, certainly, again, listen, I have done the costing of what it's going to cost Prospect and Capital Works to introduce proper drainage. It is going to be an expensive endeavor. This national lottery and the proceeds derived from it could go a long way to improving community development at all levels, removing poverty, uh, removing overgrown areas, cleaning up the community, making us feel proud uh, to live in the neighborhoods that we once grew up in. Uh, so yes, I agree wholeheartedly uh, that the lottery represents a great idea, an innovative idea, um, and with the proper regulation, excellent job creator, and we should just get on with it. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank the candidates. 16 questions. Uh, huh. We got through them. <laughs> you. <I tell> you <laughs> that. Well done. So now what we're going to do is take a short commercial break, and when we return, we'll have closing comments from each of the candidates for prospect. Please stay with us. Behind everything we do is a promise. Better. Better because we care. Because we all have a common goal. To be better at cooking. To be better at eating right. And taking care of ourselves. To live in a better community. To just feel better. Today and tomorrow and the next day. Do it for you. Do it for them. Do it to prove something to yourself. Do it to carry on a family recipe. Or just because. But when you aim for the stars, better just works. We're fosters. And we're better. Because of you. Because of them. Because of this place. And 
because we care. Welcome back to the Chamber of Commerce uh, Candidates Forums for, for Prospect. We've reached this stage in this evening where we've gone through 16 questions and uh, each of the candidates have done a great job in responding to them. Now you have two and a half minutes each for a closing statement. We begin with Sabrina. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And um, as much as I love and I am accustomed to public speaking, I never realized how quickly two minutes can pass. But let me thank you yourselves and your sponsors for allowing us this platform. Now, democracy works because of people like myself who are willing to step out and undertake the hardships of running for political office and the rigors of managing the public's business. Most importantly, what I want people to remember here this evening is that I am responding to a resounding appeal for more female representation, and I am hoping that as such, that my desire to continue in my representing the people of the Prospect and the Greater Cayman Islands will be heard by you coming out on Wednesday, April 14th, and making me your choice as your elected representative and the first female elected person for the electoral district of Prospect. I give you my word that I will not I will not let you down. I will walk with you hand in hand, side by side, as we address local, national, and international issues. For far too long, you have been fooled by broken promises that has become voiceless. You have been fooled with gifts and, and pretty parties. I am not in this race to give you a hand out. I am in this race to give us a hand up and lead us into a future that we can all be proud to say that we're Caymanians under the leadership of more females who are putting themselves in the political arena. I appeal to you to not make the popularity fool you and not come out and make your voice be heard. Your vote has value. Do not devalue your vote and not come out and let your voice heard. Do not devalue your vote for any handouts. I am here to give you a hand up. You have invested in me by trusting me to be your leader as a civil person in the community. I continue to invest in you by being able to invite you this Saturday to come out to the grand opening of my campaign headquarters, which proves that I am ready to serve you by being the first person in prospect to have a constituency office. Thank you for this opportunity. Michael Miles. I would like to thank the chamber for providing me the opportunity to come here tonight and lay out what I believe is the way forward. I'm a fighter. From the moment I was born, I'm a fighter. I was raised to be an individual who delivers on promises. I talk uh, very little, I do a lot more. Let me give you some statistics on where I'm at. When this country needed a national after school program, I put one in place because I got out there, I raised the money and I did it. When this country needed, for 30 years we, we, we've been talking about uh, um, training programs, I did it because the need was there. When this country needed mental health services to reach six and seven year olds, I, they flew me to Canada. I couldn't get the funding coming back. I raised 100000 and brought SNAP in. There are so many things that we could do different. When our country needed someone to take over the Black Pearl Skate Park to ensure that kids needed somewhere to go to play in a safe place, 7,000 kids have, is, is, has run through that park since 2013 that I've taken it over. We have to get to a point where we have to start to talk about outcomes. We can no longer talk about what plans we have. Part of my agenda, it has always been about people. Creating a district council is about engaging people. So whether it's under a mango tree or in an office, my job is to pound the pavement like I've done for 25 years. I don't need an office to do that. 
I don't need to turn on a light. I need to knock on every door. And that's what I'm about. We need sustainable development. We have to start to talk about where we're going with our country. So we need a development plan. I want to work on that. We have to start to prioritize our children. And as I said, for 28 years, I've worked on prioritizing our children in these countries. Our goal right now is to fix education. Let's stop talking about education. Let's start looking at this and implementing it. I'm ready to lead. I've been leading for 28 years, and I'll lead for the next 28 years. What I believe prospect need to now do is let's stop experimenting with leaders. Let's now elect one, and that's who I am. Mr. Austin Harris. Again, thank you uh, to the Chamber of Commerce for hosting these forums. I think they're extremely useful and important uh, to fulfilling the democratic process. I also want to say sincerely thanks to my opponents and colleagues to my right. Uh, I, think, um, I think they're good people. I think they're well-intended, and they uh, certainly want to offer a lot. They have offered a lot, but I think it also speaks very highly uh, that the democratic process in the Cayman Islands is alive and well. Uh, my colleague, Mr. Miles, talks about being outcome orientated. Uh, I think that can certainly define my first term in office and certainly as a representative of the people of the Cayman Islands. I disagree uh, with my opponent, Ms. Turner, that I haven't accomplished anything, um, that I haven't listened. I care and I've listened for four years. Uh, in terms of outcome, I have also delivered those outcomes, whether they be new roads, whether they be resurface roads, whether they be new drains, whether they be the removal of derelict vehicles that mar our communities, uh, whether it be trash and improving the collection thereof. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, more light poles installed in Prospect than any other constituency in four years, lending itself to better crime prevention and keeping our community on, on overall safe and secure. I have a track record of four years of performance and when elected by the people of Prospect on April the 14th, I will continue to deliver on those promises. I have spent four years, again, learning the system of public service and governance, working with both the policymakers and my coalition government uh, to find common ground and agreement of working together. Uh, we see that in many factors of life, but certainly none diminishes the success we have achieved together in COVID, uh, the only jurisdiction in the world not practicing social distancing, uh, you know, not wearing masks. We have, as of today's press conference, 90% of our at-risk, most vulnerable population vaccinated, working our way towards herd immunity. But I have not done it alone. So I am encouraging the people of the Cayman Islands, the people of Prospect, re-elect Austin Harris, number one on your ballot paper, one good term deserves another, but also elect me in combination with the progressive-led alliance, and we will continue to lead this country and its people from strength to strength. Thank you to the candidates. i now turn it over to President Michael Gibbs to deliver some closing remarks. Thank you, Will. On behalf of the Chamber Council and staff, I'd like to thank the prospect candidates for participating in this evening's forum, and I trust the forum will help the pros prospect voters to determine who to vote for when you go to the polls on the 14th of April. I'd also like to thank Fosters for their major sponsorship uh, of the Chamber's candidate forums, as well as our other sponsors, Affinity, Bodden's Legal and Corporate, and Dart. Also during the uh, commercial breaks, we've been showing the first of the Growth Matters series of videos. Uh, and if you uh, would like to uh, access more of those, they can be found at the growthmatters.ky website and they're free to uh, access for anyone. Uh, please join us tomorrow evening as we welcome the candidates from the constituency of Savannah, uh, Heather Bodden, Malcolm Eden, and Gianna Williams. So thank you again for tuning in. I hope you will join us again tomorrow night at the same time. Good night. Behind everything you do is a promise. Better. Better because we care. Because we all have a common goal. To 
be better at cooking, to be better at eating right, and taking care of ourselves, to live in a better community, to just feel better. Today and tomorrow and the next day. Do it for you. Do it for them. Do it to prove something to yourself. Do it to carry on a family recipe. Or just because. But when you aim for the stars, better just works. We're fosters. And we're better. Because of you. Because of them. Because of this place. And because we care.